Today I'm going to make a powerful hypnotic sedative called chlorobutanol from only three ingredients. These are potassium hydroxide, acetone, and bleach. To get started, I first poured one liter of 10% bleach into a smaller container and then tossed it in the freezer until it had chilled to well below zero degrees Celsius. This was then poured into a one liter beaker and to it I added 100 milliliters of acetone before giving it a quick stir. The reaction between acetone and bleach is called a haliform reaction. In this specific reaction, the acetone first reacts with excess hydroxide in the bleach, undergoing a keto-enol tautomerization to form the enolate. This enolate then undergoes an electrophilic attack by the hypochlorite, which attaches a chloride to one of the acetone's two methyl groups. This repeats until every hydrogen of this methyl group has been replaced by chlorine. In the next step of the reaction, the chlorinated acetone undergoes a nucleophilic acyl substitution with hydroxide with CCH3 being the leaving group stabilized by three electron withdrawing groups. In the final step of the reaction, the chloroform carbanion abstracts a proton from the acetic acid formed in the previous step, forming sodium acetate and the target product chloroform. Chloroform is a chemical that on its own was long used as an anesthetic, as well as a refrigerant and a useful lab solvent. It has extremely limited solubility in water and will slowly settle out as the reaction proceeds. One thing to keep in mind is that this reaction is incredibly exothermic, which is the main reason the bleach was cooled down to such an extreme degree. Even with extensive pre-cooling, this reaction is so exothermic that the reaction mixture heated itself from negative 10 to 38 degrees Celsius in less than a minute. That said, doing this reaction using room temperature bleach could be a genuine hazard. Anyway, this is allowed to continue reacting for about another half hour, and then I pour it all into a large separatory funnel. Being far denser than water, the chloroform all quickly settles to the bottom where it can be drained away and collected. I then dried the chloroform using a few grams of calcium chloride, and if I was going to use this chloroform as a solvent, I would then pour it off and redistill it. However, this is unnecessary for making chlorobutanol, and once the chloroform is dry, I simply pour it into a graduated cylinder to get a rough final volume of 27 milliliters. This chloroform was then placed in an ice bath, and in the meantime, I then added 67 milliliters of dry acetone to an Erlenmeyer flask that was also placed on an ice bath. To this, I slowly added the chloroform once it had cooled to near zero degrees Celsius. At this point, I rethought my whole ice bath set up before slowly adding a few flakes of potassium hydroxide to the mixture under constant stirring. It's a bit difficult to see, but this will result in the solution becoming a bit cloudy as the reaction proceeds. In total I added 4.7 grams of potassium hydroxide to drive the reaction to completion, but the additions are done very slowly as this reaction is also very exothermic. In fact, in my experience, this is even more exothermic than the haliform reaction, and I want to make sure that the reaction temperature does not exceed 10 degrees Celsius. To that end, I basically just added a few flakes, let the temperature of the reaction spike, and then let it cool back down to around 1 to 3 degrees before adding a few more flakes, and then repeating until all of the potassium hydroxide had been added. Now, I wasn't able to find any literature on any detailed synthesis mechanism for this reaction, but I'll try to explain what I think is going on. As is always the case with these type of mechanisms, I'm just kind of making them up as I go, and feel free to offer any corrections in the comments. Anyway, I believe an obvious starting point of this reaction would be the deprotonation of chloroform by hydroxide to form a chloroform carbanion. This would happen very fast and could explain the majority of the heat generated by the reaction. The reactive chloroform carbanion would then likely attack the central carbon of acetone, pushing the electrons from the pi bond to the oxygen, which would then likely abstract the hydrogen that was displaced in the first step, forming the product chlorobutanol. Now, two things I'm still somewhat unsure about here are the stoichiometry of this reaction and the byproducts. I know for a fact that the chloroform carbanion is extremely unstable and would likely alpha eliminate to give dichlorocarbene and a chloride anion. This chloride would then bind to the potassium cation freed upon the deprotonation of the chloroform forming potassium chloride, which is really the only way to explain the solution becoming cloudy the way it does. However, the chloride ion would likely facilitate a slow equilibrium between dichlorocarbene and the chloroform carbanion 
which would be pushed to favor the carbanion as potassium hydroxide is regenerated in the final step of the reaction. In that way, it seems as though potassium hydroxide primarily acts as a catalyst in this reaction. However, given there is a very substantial amount of potassium chloride in the reaction mixture even once the reaction has very clearly gone to completion, it does seem as though there is certainly an equilibrium mechanism here that produces some amount of potassium chloride as a byproduct. In any case, once the reaction was complete, the mixture was transferred to a beaker and gently heated to drive off as much excess acetone as possible. This was continued until the mixture was around 82 degrees Celsius, at which point I went ahead and dumped it all into a beaker of ice water. Chlorobutanol is only very slightly soluble in water, so the majority will crash out while any potassium chloride or hydroxide will readily dissolve. The crude chlorobutanol was then collected by vacuum filtration and then transferred to another beaker to be redissolved in a minimal volume of hot ethanol. Once the chlorobutanol had completely redissolved, hot water was then slowly added to the hot ethanol until the solution became ever so slightly cloudy. This indicates a total saturation of the recrystallization mixture, which is what we want. I went ahead and then brought this up to a boil to clear the solution up before I cut the heat and placed the beaker in an ice bath to recrystallize the chlorobutanol. Once the solution had cooled to near 0 degrees Celsius, I broke up the chlorobutanol crystals and collected them once again by vacuum filtration. These were then dried thoroughly by a few hours under vacuum desiccation and weighed for a final mass of 20.84 grams representing a 35.2% yield. This yield is honestly around what I expected given the synthesis route, and it might have been somewhat higher if I'd started with pure chloroform. I tried weighing this again after another few days of desiccation, as the crystals still seemed somehow to be almost damp, but the change was only slight and could honestly be due to sublimation of the chlorobutanol itself, rather than the removal of any residual water. Regardless, I'm happy with how this went overall. As for the chlorobutanol product, it seems to form as lightweight flaky crystals that have a very distinct and quite strong odor. This somewhat surprised me given the relatively faint smell of all the reagents used, and I honestly have no idea how to even describe the smell. It smells somewhat like camphor mixed with mint, and at the same time reminds me of something you might smell in a hospital, but also something you might smell in a forest. It is somewhat sweet, and pleasant at first, becoming increasingly unpleasant the longer you're around it. In that way, I feel the same way about ethyl acetate being pleasant at first and irritating after an hour. As a final note, I did want to comment on the use of chlorobutanol as a hypnotic sedative since I began the video by stating that it was. Now, in terms of its hypnotic, sedative, and local anesthetic properties, it's very similar to chloral hydrate, with one big difference. This difference is that chloral hydrate has a half-life of around 3 to 5 minutes in the body, while chlorobutanol has a half-life of around 37 days. Now I'm not sure why chlorobutanol has such a long half-life compared to chloral hydrate, maybe it's something to do with its solubility, but what is certain is that having a half-life this long is extremely dangerous. It means that once you've overdosed, you've overdosed for the next month, at least. Imagine you're like, crossfaded or something, but that lasts for an entire month, and it's also hypnotic. Um, it sounds like one of the worst things I can imagine. Because of this, chlorobutanol doesn't really see a lot of use inside of hospitals anymore, mostly because of its very, very high propensity to bioaccumulate and lead to situations like this. Anyway, that's all I have for today. I hope you found this interesting, and as always, I want to thank all my wonderful patrons for their generous contributions. Your support is vital and very appreciated. To everyone else, if you'd like to see more content like this, consider subscribing on TikTok, YouTube, Instagram, or even by becoming a patron yourself. Thank you all so much for watching, and I'll see you next time.